so my name is Vishal and I'm going to be presenting the spectral normalization GAN. Uh, this paper was uh, proposed by guys at Prefer Networks. They're doing really cool work. I actually did a, a summer, Google Summer of Code with a Chainer organization, which is being actively developed by uh, the Prefer Networks guys, and they're doing really amazing work. They actually have a, a GAN library. If some of you are doing projects on GAN library, you can check it out. It's pretty convenient. Right, uh, so spectral normalization. Uh, last time we saw that, um, uh, saw the problem of discriminator. Uh, if the discriminator was very abrupt in its predictions, then we would get a condition of uh, discriminator saturation, which means that uh, if our discriminator was, let's say, something very close to uh, zero one, switch uh, like a step jump function then gradients at uh, the gradients that it can give our generator at any point would be almost meaningless because it the generator would be confused in which direction to progress right so in order to have our generator learn gradually and uh, consistently what we want is we want to enforce a, a smoothness criteria to our generator uh, our discriminator function Essentially, we want our uh, discriminator function to be sufficiently smooth so that at any point we get a good enough gradient to constantly improve our generator. And that is what spectral normalization proposes. So, our, uh, we can imagine our neural network, Fx, which is parameterized by theta, uh, as a composition of different functions, f1 to fl. So your F1 function would be the first layer, which inputs an X, multiplies a weight matrix and adds a uh, bias and then applies an activation function on them. You can imagine that this a neural network is basically a composition of functions, which is F L plus one, F L until F1 of input X. Right. And the way we sort of enforce this smoothness criteria is we limit our functions, we limit the possible F functions into a subspace of all F functions, uh, which we call it as K Lipschitz continuous. Like, uh, we later define what Lipschitz continuity actually entails with a simpler example, but overall uh, the idea is that, let's say our discriminator function is a function of this neural network, which, which is basically uh, you apply a softmax layer to the output layer. Uh, this A function, you can imagine it as a softmax to the output. It's again a composition. And your discriminator function basically uses this F neural network inside of it. And this was our previous definition of the minimax game that generator and discriminator play. Uh, we update our definition of VGD to fit to this. This is basically a subspace of a possible VGD uh, combinations, VGD games, which ensures that my discriminator uses a neural network which obeys K Lipschitz continuity. Uh, what is K Lipschitz continu continuity? Let's see that in, in a very simple, simple case when you just have a single layer. And uh, so let's say you have n inputs and m outputs, and this neural net layer uh, G, uh, which expects an input dimension of h, uh, input vector of H belonging to h, and output outputs a vector in h out. What, how do we define the Lipschitz continuity of this function, or rather, this is called the Lipschitz norm? Uh, it's this maths is a bit complicated, but we can actually visualize it in, in the one dimensional case, in, in case where h in is one dimensional, this is r1, and h out is also r1. Let's say we have an arbitrary function like this, which maps uh, x to y. This Lipschitz uh, norm for this function basically means the maximum gradient that I can see at any point, maximum norm of gradient. So, if my G is a single dimensional mapping, mod of G, 
could be thought of as max over all inputs uh, mod of dgx by dx, the maximum value of gradient that I'll see in any input. And uh, that's what my Lipschitz constant is. It, it basically means that at no point would I get a gradient higher than this. And if I bound it, if I say that uh, my function has this Lipschitz norm of value k, it means that at no point would I see a very huge jump in the value of, uh, in the, in the value of gradient. Right. And how do we extend it to multi-dimensional case when your input is uh, n-dimensional vector and output is let's say m-dimensional vector? The simple idea is um, this del g h is basically a matrix which uh, which is basically giving you how much you need to change a particular uh, unit in the output uh, when you change a particular unit in the input, and this is almost similar to this mod the only difference is that instead of uh, this mod this maps a single dimension to a single dimension this ma maps a matrix to a single dimension and uh, the supremum of h is same as maximum of x you can imagine it as if you have a point here uh, in a hyperdimensional space this you are looking at all the possible directions of all the possible unit directions and if you move in that direction you, you'll get a, a change in values of all the outputs. You take the norm of the values of all the outputs, uh, L2 naught, and figure out a direction which has this highest L2 naught. The value at that direction becomes basically the output of sigma. And if you find the maximum point H such that you get that maximum value, uh, that is basically the maximum gradient that you'll ever see. In your domain. How do we now enforce this Lipschitz continuity in our um, neural network? We saw that we can find out Lipschitz continuity for a single layer. The cool fact about Lipschitz functions is that for a composition, it just uh, breaks down into an inequality over individual such functions. So if I, if I have g of uh, g1 of g2 and I take the Lipschitz norm of it, it basically is something less than G1 times G2. Uh, Lipschitz norm of, of G1 times Lipschitz norm of G2. In case our neural network, since we saw that neural network is basically a composition of several layers, we basically can find out the Lipschitz constant of the entire network as the multiplication of different compositions Lipschitz constant. Uh, and uh, by specific choice of uh, activation functions, we can ensure that these activation functions give us a Lipschitz norm 1. So basically we would only be dealing with Lipschitz constant of individual weight matrices. The interesting thing is, um, yeah, right, if your G is a neural network, this del GH is basically the weight matrix, right, because uh, the output is linearly dependent on the weight, so this del GH, simply you can replace it by W matrix. And if we do that, we get a very simple inequality that this Lipschitz, F Lipschitz uh, constant of uh, the neural network is basically less than or equal to the products of individual weight matrices, sigma value. Sigma is basically finding out uh, yeah, this max. Right. And how do we make sure that our Lipschitz constant of a neural network is adhering to a, a, a highest value of let's say k or in, in this sense let's say 1. What we can do is we can basically divide all our weight matrices by this value. Since our weight matrices are the gradients, if we divide it by something, the gradients are uh, linearly scaled by that factor. So we can ensure that this f function has uh, is one Lipschitz continuous if we divide it by this computed factor. Right. Uh, spectral normalization paper also proposed another way of uh, another loss function. Like traditionally, or the original pro proposal, the loss function that we used was log uh, log uh, loss. They have proposed that instead of using log loss, we use um, hinge loss, 
and there is a reasoning for it, uh, but it is not that relevant according to the lecture. Uh, and it was first proposed in geometric and paper. Right, uh, I'll come back to this slide. It basically discusses the architecture. But before that, let's see how do we implement spectral normalization in uh, our machine learning library. Um, how many of you are actually comfortable with TensorFlow? TensorFlow Okay, all right. Uh, so let's actually skip this or rather discuss a very simplified version of this. You need not care about what these functions mean. I'll just explain what it is doing. So before discussing what spectral normalization is, Let's just see how a simple batch normalization can be implemented. Batch normalization is basically you want to normalize your uh, uh, weight matrix, uh, sorry, normalize your output so that um, you basically add a layer of, uh, yeah, you basically uh, scale it. So let's say your uh, layer's output was X. Yeah, um, right, so uh, the idea is in batch normalization for an output x, you basically compute the mean and variance, variance of that uh, output or that uh, input, sorry, x, and then you scale it down to a factor, uh, to, to uh, something between zero and one, using, or, or rather scale it down to uh, something which is uh, centered around the mean and has a variance of uh, your variance, and you again scale it up using a new using a layer of uh, variables and return this output as now return the output of against the scaled up version, right? Um, in conditional batch normalization, actually conditional batch normalization is a pretty neat neat trick. Uh, what we do in conditional Yeah, in conditional batch normalization, the idea is that um, in case when you're training images on classified on uh, images on data set with class labels, what you can do is make your model uh, um, like not agnostic of the classes it belongs to. So the basic idea is you use the class labels to train a classifier, which instead of outputting k k um, different classes, it outputs k plus one, where one plus one is that the class is that of the generator. It's, it basically outputs that the image was generated by the generator instead of it coming from any of those classes. And it's a pretty neat trick because it allows us to uh, generate models, uh, generate images from different um, classes conveniently instead of just hoping that it generates something from my class, I can ask it to generate something from a particular class. Right, so how do you use conditional batch normalization? How do you implement conditional batch normalization? This method is actually very similar to your actual batch normalization. The only difference is you are having this, uh, this input Y, which is basically your class label, and the, that the layer that you're creating, the variable that you're creating for uh, scaling up the scaled down version, you are making it a dense layer instead of just a trainable layer. Uh, you are making it a dense, dense layer, which also inputs Y along with X instead of just a variable um, to scale up with, right? And how do you implement conditional batch normalization? This is also a pretty interesting part. So all you need to do is, the way you're creating your weight matrix, you make sure that this weight matrix adheres to one uh, k Lipschitz constant. And we do this by, by using something called power iterations. This power iteration uh, is a 
simple mechanism uh, which actually allows you to come to scale it down uh, to one delicious function and the way you do it is let's say you have initialized u to be a random vector initialized random u and the, you basically multiply your weight matrix to u and then set the output of uh, v as weight matrix times u and then you update u to be weight matrix times v and you keep on doing it in a loop so the end result is that you get approximately the sigma of w same as u w uh, u transpose w something like this it's a pretty neat trick and uh, actually it has been shown to convert super fast and uh, there is another intuition on why this works so we saw that we for any point uh, we want to find the general direction which has the maximum gradient what we can do it do do is you, you just randomly select a direction and you update you improve your direction by computing what is the gradient in this direction and you iteratively do it and you will converge to this point super fast and within one or two steps that is how your power iteration method works and uh, so your dense neural network basically if you set this use spectral normalization to true it would basically normalize your weight matrix using the function that we saw before which conducts power iteration and we'll have a, a, a smooth neural network with one Lipschitz continuity which is nice right so the summary of spectral normalization can this was the first GAN that could be trained on the entire ImageNet data, all the classes included, and it gave really impressive results. And uh, the quality of the images generated were also high quality, and it has some computational benefits over WGAN. Right, uh, we have some results for, yeah, these are some results. We can see that it is generating pizzas. Uh, different kinds of pizzas, although they are not very perfect, uh, but they are new images which are not in the data. And what neural network architectures have they used? So we saw that we could have either a unconditional tra or a traditional generative adversarial networks, which is agnostic of the class labels of the actual data set, or we can have a, a conditional GAN which actually uses that information, the supervised information of what class labels uh, those images are from. Uh, and this is the general architecture, it's pretty standard. Standard, they, have, they are just stacking up several uh, residual blocks. And uh, for conditional case, you can see an embedding of the class labels, which is something in the middle, instead of it being on the top as, as usually done, or as was usually done. Right. Let's see why we do that. Um, this concept is called projection discriminator. It's not discussed very thoroughly in the uh, class, uh, in the lectures, actually. Um, the idea is in creating your conditional GANs, you can either provide the class label information in the top layer as the input. So this is the first case. You can uh, you compute your adversarial loss by providing the ca uh, class label as the first layer input by concatenating it with the uh, image vector or other yeah, image vector. Or you can actually have this input concatenated in some intermediate layer so that the first layer learns the information about the images. Some uh, like pretty, pretty standard thing, you, you run some convolution layers in the previous part and then the output of the convolution layers, you linearize it and add a uh, Y the class label information embedded like this usually instead of it being zero one uh, to like integers you sometimes map it to embeddings like zero 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 one zero zero one zero so that you have a vector instead of these numbers which makes um, classification or uh, giving adversarial loss easy uh, AC GANs I didn't understand a whole lot what they meant but it seemed as though instead of using Y uh, inside the neural network, inside the discriminator network to compute adversarial loss, 
they compute adversarial loss independently and then they also compute a classification loss using y using the class tables and they somehow use both of them together and this is called projection discriminator this is also proposed by guys at preferred networks and um, this is a bit difficult to understand uh, i couldn't follow exactly what they meant but it seemed as though what they meant to us uh, you have a rcnn uh, network which embeds your input images and you use your you have an embedding of your y of your class labels and you take the inner product of it and somehow add it to the adversarial loss computed without this part so it it has kind of become standard and now is the thing that is commonly used so next we will see self attention gan uh, this is going to be presented by the next presenter let's stop for a bit here um and ask uh, Risha uh, any questions you have about uh, this spectral normalization yeah so anyone want to try to summarize the integration between what what a SNGAN is trying to do what why is the spectral normalization important shall we go back to the very beginning when um, yes. Michelle was talking about uh, Lipschitz So why is that a important constraint? I think Michelle was trying to explain on the left side there, right? The, the diagram, you know, with our unidimensional X, you, you have um, the derivative or the gradient, right? And you don't want the gradient to be too steep. Why, why won't you want it to be too steep? Um, because it makes more like unstable too, and uh, maybe it converts to like long like uh, long like solution. Right. I mean, there's this other part that we were talking about at the beginning, right here, right, where uh, Rishal was talking about this problem about this step function, right? And since if you're a discriminator, if your discriminator can do too good a job of discriminating state from real, then your GAN is not going to benefit, right? But your generator needs to have a gradient to work with. Right? So this is like saturation of uh, Yes, this is gradient saturation. So if you ensure that your uh, discriminator outputs something which which is k Lipschitz continuous, or let's say one, it has a maximum gradient of one, uh, this m is equal to one the maximum gradient that you can see is one then it inherently ensures that you would not see such a step function which improves the quality of the generator the generator keeps on moving towards a value which confuses discriminator and the discriminator keeps on trying to um, like not get confused which is an interesting property it has been linked that uh, the quality of the generated images depend very closely to how uh, smooth your discriminator function is in the entire entirety of the learning time. So the ensure rate by dividing it by what? Yeah, so the idea is, is right. So the idea is, let's say you came up with a neural network which is giving very steep values. All you do is you divide the weight matrix by a factor which ensures that it is no longer that steep. And the factor they get into all that singular. Yes, it's called the spectral system. normalization. Yeah. So you cannot actually find out the exact direction or exact value to divide it to because it's uh, computationally inefficient. So they give you a very uh, approximate, very fast converting approximate method to find out an, a, a very close value to that. And so that they keep on the power iteration. Yeah, that's a power iteration. But actually the power iteration that somewhere I was reading, if you run it a few times, it actually gives you the... Yeah, if you run it once or twice. But here they said they only run it once. Right? Right. I mean, it's a neural network, so if you run it two times, so it increases the computation time uh, for those layers twice. So you want to limit it. So I think that that's an important consideration. Also, you you don't care if it is too far from being a constant. You don't want to enforce that this is a, something absolutely less than this. As long as it is something comparable to it, it gives reasonable. 
is as well vital. Say, uh, I thought just the power installation itself to run it quite should not be that. I mean, of course, these matrices are large, but they still uh, local. I mean, you're not running the whole uh, network speed path. It's not that. Right? No, it's, it's just so every time you update the weight matrices, this weight matrices are normalized. Yeah, but the normalization itself, in theory, you can run it more than. It's a local. Yes, yes. Right? It's not an entire. Yeah, and not all the networks. Maybe I can do it only on a few layers. If yeah, the batch normalization there, but that is also sometimes a consideration because usually people apply normalization to every layer. Even if one layer violates your normalization, then you cannot guarantee that function is that the entire network is k elliptic. So you need no, to no, normalize. Say you can run say some more time. You can Maybe everything you can run once at least. So you have some kind of yes, yes. normalization going on. Right. My argument is that. Uh, they probably chose one or two iterations only to make sure that training time doesn't increase by a factor. Like if you set it to two, every day is being normalized, so maybe the runtime would be twice or close to twice. To stop that from happening, maybe they set it to one. Yeah, I didn't agree with the reasoning there because most likely it wouldn't give a value uh, just in one iteration. Sure. Any other questions? Uh, anyone want to try to summarize what's going on in the NSMDN before we go back to our first presenter? Lisa, are you ready? Yeah. Okay, so you can uh, get ready to start. Um, so, you know, the power iteration is a, a, a very common practice that we use for other things as well. So, if you've heard of page rank, that's also power iteration over a JCP matrix. So, the nice thing about power iteration is because it says power, right? You, you do it more than once, you're getting an exponential benefit from it. So you can converge to a solution very fast, which is actually what Michelle was trying to say. So even though you can get an exact solution quickly, I guess the whole point of the course, uh, which the lecturers had said earlier, is like, we're not looking at it from a theoretical point of view, we're just trying to cut our teeth and make sure something good comes out of the pipeline, right? So we're, we're, we'll cut uh, computation where we don't need to. So I think the whole point here is that uh, you know you're trying to at least get your discriminator not to 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 uh, have saturation, um, and then that's going to help your generator uh, generate useful images. So just to like once they train this uh, at the end, does the discriminator really discriminate uh, the image as well? In spite of the meaning, in theory, we would want something like that. Yeah. A really good discriminator will have a right. very top type of image. But now we're forcefully trying to keep it a, a bit uh, smooth. Yeah. yeah. So the question then becomes is like after you do this, is, is the discriminator still good or at some point you start going normal? It still works. So uh, actually, we are good as long as. So the gradient of generator depends on how far from 0.5 the value of the discriminator goes, right? On the definition. Exactly, and the discriminator keeps on training its way so that given an input image, it gives it a value either very high or very low, right? So the point that we want to show is that as you move, so basically let's say this is the set of images generated from, uh, taken from data, and this is what the generator is uh, outputting, this, this generator is outputting something from here. What we want to see is that as we move from uh, data, actual data to my generator, I should see a gradual drop in my discriminator's confidence, right? And it doesn't mean, so if, if I'm partitioning, if my discriminator works very well, it doesn't mean that it has to be a step function. So it doesn't mean that I need to give uh, all ones values here and zero values here. I could have a smooth gradual decline because data set is something there are images that the generator that, that are not either in the generator or the data. And for those for a con contour like that, I'm okay with predicting something in between those extreme values, but I want points in either of these to have extreme values. So what I'm trying to ensure is that as I move in a contour from data to uh, generator, I see a gradual decline. So that if my generator ends up generating a point here, I know which direction. So there's a logic function that then you have like anything over 0.5 is good. Is no, it more no broader logic. or is it still like a very It's taken into thing. account, yeah. It's taken, actually there is no step thing anywhere because the generator's output is 
uh, so the distributor's values are used for training the generator. So as long as it's with the zero and one, it, it trains, but uh, it, the gradient is conveniently computed only for the smooth. Unhappy with that. And, uh, the gist of what this is doing. Okay. Um, so in the interest of time, let's thank the shop for uh, <laughs> dark in the front, can you guys see all right? Problems with vanilla cans, right? And I guess, like, in particular, like when training again, you face this dilemma where you know, if like if you you want to train your screen to optimality, but if your the screen does a great job, then the gradient saturates, right? But then, if the, the screen behaves badly, then you're not optimizing for the JS anymore, and also in a way, the generator does not have an like, accurate feedback, and uh. And I guess another, so other than that, another point I want to make is also the problem of low dimensional supports. As this is like one of the key points that the authors in the WGAN paper use to justify their, their new distance measure. So uh, I think this thing is talked about in this paper over here that. Um, like our real distribution and our discriminant and our generated distribution lie on typically lie on known dimensional manifolds. And this contributes to the instability of the entry. So the reason why this is so is because like if uh like what's about our real data set, right? Like the dimensions is argued to be like artificially high because yeah, and they actually have found the concentrate on a lower dimensional manifold. So thinking of our our real distribution, our let's say our real world images, right? So like for example, once the like a specific team for their set has been fixed, right? The images have a lot of restrictions support, right? Like for example, a dog should have like this features like two years and a tail. And these restrictions keep the images away from having this high dimensional report. And likewise for our generator distribution, also lies on low dimensional manifolds because as you imagine, our generator is asked to generate a much larger image, right? So let's say it's 64 by 64, and that's really like 4096 dimensions, given a noise vector of let's say 100 dimensions. So uh, I guess you can say that like the, the distribution of colors over this for 4096 pixels. It's only defined by this small hundredth dimensional noise vector. 
and it can really hardly fill up the whole dimensional space. So, and why this is problem? Because if both our generator and our real distribution lie on low dimensional manifolds, they are most certainly going to be disjoint, right? And when you have disjoint supports, you are always going to be capable of finding a perfect discriminator. And well, a perfect discriminator, right? So you, you always separate your real samples with 100% accuracy. And that will result in uh, zero gradient uh, everywhere, right? So that's the problem with two dimensional supports. Yeah. So these are the contributions of the WGAP paper. And uh, so finally, you are able to train the discriminator to convergence, right? So unlike in vanilla game, you no longer need to balance your uh, generator and discriminator updates. And Another thing is that our it's actually correlation between distributed loss and perceptual quality, which is right, it's a good thing, right? Because right, in traditional adversarial training, like the loss doesn't really mean anything. And right now we actually have a signal to gauge training progress. And maybe you can even like uh, have a whole up set to check if our model is overfitting. And before I, before I jump to W again, I'll just quickly talk a bit about what this new distance measure actually is. Okay. So what the Wessersine distance is, is you know, if you imagine the probability distributions as like different heaps, right? As masses of different heaps of certain amount. Then this Wessersine distance is just the minimum amount of energy it takes to transform this heap to the other heap, right? This probability distribution to the other probability distribution. So yeah, so technically is the is the minimum energy cost of moving and transforming a part of the is of one probability distribution to the shape of the other distribution where where by energy I mean the amount of property mass times the moving distance. Okay. And that's why it's also this beautifully called the earth movers distance. So maybe this will be clearer by a simple example. So I'll try to like unpack this like notation over here. So right, simple example. Right? So let's say you want to transform this uh, this distribution to so this distribution over here, right? Okay. So let's just take two arbitrary discrete probability distributions as a simple example, right? So like. Since probability distributions are defined by how much mass they put on each point, so calculating this which time distance is it's not optimized as a problem, right? Where uh, and if the distribution is continuous, there's actually uh, definitely many ways, right, to move the Earth around to another distribution. So, so first, let's just call our let's just define this transport plan gamma, which is just a matrix that describes how we we'll distribute the amount of move from the domain of PR to the domain of PG, or vice versa, okay? So let's say, right, so we have to move this distribution, move these heaps of earth to this area over here, right? So let's say if we consider moving, uh, right, we shift two miles of dirt from position three to position nine, right? And this, this is just represented by value two in our transport matrix, right? So gamma three nine equals two just means we are shifting like two amounts of property mass from position three to position nine, right? So the energy cost is just calculated by this lab, right? So the amount of property mass times the distance moved, okay? And yeah, so there's many, distribution plans that's possible, right? So this is just one particular transport plan over here, where we have successfully moved all the mass from one distribution to the next, right? And the total energy cost is just, you know, you multiply every value in your gamma matrix with the clear distance with the x and y, right? And yeah, so, 
different transport plans don't necessarily say, share the same cost, right? So we're trying to find the minimum transport plan for our side business. Okay. And also it turns out that we can, like our transport plan is really just some joint profit distribution, right? In that, so for our transport plan to be valid, it has this constraint where, you know, if we want to successfully transform our PR into PG, we have to have the constraint that if we try to sum up our values uh, horizontally and vertically, you have to end up with our PR and PG, right? We should treat back our PR and PG distributions respectively. Right? In other words, uh, right, the, the amount of mass that leaves uh, PR should be PR, right? And the amount of mass that ends up in PG should be PG. So, so our gamma, we can split view gamma as a joint product distribution of PIPG, where, where you know, any single valid transport plan is just belongs to the set of all joint distributions where the marginals are PIPG, right? So with this, and that's why we end up with this, with our, this notation over here, right? In that, really what this expression means is just, we are just trying to find the smallest uh, value amount or value transport plans, right? Where the value of finding is just the energy, the total energy cost. Okay. Right, is that all right? Any questions about the distance, definition of distance? Any comments about Herbert's distance versus Well, if you guys are um, listening to each other, you can also think about you know why, what difference does it make to you to minimize the uh, you know, distribution difference function. Okay, so yeah, so to recap, these are the distance measures that we have talked about, right? Uh, yeah, so we have KL, plot, and back with KL. And GS divergence. So the authors of the paper argue that, like, that even when two distributions are located in lower dimensional manifolds without any like overlaps, like our Westside distance still can provide a meaningful and smooth representation of the distance between them. Okay. And in the paper, they demonstrated some this very simple example of why. WD works better in that. So let's say we have these two two-dimensional distributions, right? So we have uh, distribution P, which is just where x is zero and y is the uniform distribution, and we have another distribution Q where, where x is just some theta where theta is between zero and one, and y is also the uniform distribution, right? So we have this. Like, so if these two distributions where and when theta is zero, they completely overlap, and when theta is not zero, they are like they are disjoint. So, and if we were to try and plug in our plug in these values into our distance measure, this is actually what we get in that. Yeah. So let me derive this. You can derive it. So like, so like for example, for the both the KL forward and backward, right? If if the distribution are disjoint, you'll get something like uh, log log one over zero, right? So and you get so you get infinity, right? So uh, when you know, when you're disjoint, the KL this is measure just gives you infinity. And it's similar for JS in that well, it's not infinity. It still jumps to log two, right? And only our W, our Westside distance provides a smooth measure. Because for our for WD is just uh, right. Because the two distributions are just like translations of each other, right? Where the best transport plan is just moving the mass in a straight line. So that's why it's just theta.
one time so Yeah, so I guess in a way this example kind of shows that there exists like some distributions that don't converge under JSKL but do converge under the EM distance. And also uh, that for the JS and KL divergences, there are cases where the gradient is always zero, right? Like in this example. And also the paper points out other things like uh, like it also proves that like when the generator function is so-called sufficiently nice, only this with side distance has guarantees of continuity and differentiability. And also uh, that for, for every distribution that converges under KLJS, it also converges under the WD distance, our upper distance. Yeah, so yeah, so since our earth movers distance doesn't like saturate or blow up for distributions with different supports. It means we can still get signals right in these cases. So, and that we don't have to worry about training our discriminator to optimality. Right. So, overall, from the author's uh, really compelling argument for using our approval systems for charity forms. Yeah. So, firstly, how do we actually compute this distance, right? Because it's intractable to exhaust all the possible joint distributions to compute WD, right? So, uh, in the paper, it shows that we have this duality where we can just compute an approximation like this. So, I think actually look into like the derivation of this because the same pretty involved. But do anyone actually want to talk about it? Derivation. Right. I think the thought is fine. Any questions about how to calculate EMD? It's pretty easy. The intuition for EMD is pretty simple, right? I used to think of a bulldozer trying to move turf around, and that's exactly what it corresponds to. Right. It has those properties that Ezo was talking about, that it, uh, you know, it has a, a good. It's a well-defined value on cases where uh, JS and KL doesn't have uh, useful values. And why would that be more important for a GAN compared to a, a normal neural network? I mean, typically you hear much more about KL and JS, right? Because I think in the other examples, we are directly trying to estimate the other properties. That is the whole reason. Purpose of our EA unit is we are trying to get to uh, some estimate of Px at the lower bounds. We want the likelihood. We want the likelihood. Yeah, we have nothing. Yeah, we are not. We are sacrificing. It's an explicit uh, distribution of the framework that we just want. Exactly right. So uh, again, the uh, the first of the implicit uh, models that we study in this part, right? So we, we don't care about the likelihood at all. We just want to be able to sample well. And that's the only uh, requisite that we want to have. So we, we can use a, a wider class of uh, uh, functions uh, uh, just to try to stretch it out. Yeah. And I think here it's important to remember that we have two different networks. We have the discriminator and generator. And they start out fairly different from each other, right? And, and um, that's the reason why we might have, a, I think, that we might have very different um, uh, distributions for them. And that's why we might end up with the case that Giza is talking about now, where the distributions don't overlap at all and have some big problem. Right? So when we start out GAN training, we might have these different ones. But as we, we get the GAN and the uh, uh, generator and discriminator pair to, to get closer to each other, maybe it's okay to go back to something like KL or, or JS. But what do you guys think? That's just my 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 feeling for best best about it. Uh, I'm just wondering how can we choose a gamma for asking about this? How do you choose the gamma for earth movement distance? 
Uh, Did they mention that at all? Is this some sort of kind of hype up on it though? Or, yeah, so I have no idea about this. So, so, there is no gamma. Actually, it's going to find gamma. To compute our. Uh, yeah, to compute uh, the distance. maximum our distance. We need to define gamma. Uh, so I think I, I don't know, but I think it's sort of in the limit optimization, but in the paper, uh, it just introduces this duality where we can just compute our distance by finding this. Right? So we just need to find um, the largest value for this expression among all k Lipschitz continuous functions. <laughs> you think you were asking about? Sorry, sorry. No, okay. no, she was uh, Yeah, so, yeah, so. Yeah, so again, it's not like, I guess it's not possible to obtain this at analytically, right? So, what we can do is just use a new network. So, we parameterize our app using a new network, and we just learn the parameters using gradient set. Right, so we end up this so we, right in there. So we just need to find we just need to use a new network to find to learn some good weights and a good FW so that we can approximate this above distance. So what, so with this, what will the training look like, right? So, yeah, so first we have to compute our earth movement distance first, right? So we train our, yeah, so we compute this first, right? So as the expression suggests, we sample from our real data and our generator. And just train our, and just train our neural network right, to convergence using gradient descent in this case, in order to get approximation for our waste time distance. Okay, so so we train the convergence. So now that we have an approximation of our earth mover systems, we will then um, train our generator right using this distance. So, and that ends up being this, right? So if we take the gradient of our distance, what we get is we just sample from the generator and just train our generator using gradient set. Okay. And if you realize this is very similar to our, <laughs> similar to the minimax setup, right? Of our original linear again, right? Yeah, so this, this is pretty cool, right, in that like the idea of adversarial training naturally emerges from this abstract idea of minimizing the whole resistance together with some approximations. Yeah, so in a way, uh, I hope you realize that our F is actually, actually refers to our discriminator, right? So, but in this case, technically, our discriminator now isn't, its job isn't really like counting the fixed samples apart, right? But it really is, what it that he's trying to do is to to be tra to train to learn this uh, k-loop shift continuous function to help compute the rest time distance. Right. So comparing to the original GAN, we have this right, and then similarly we still have this right. We still end up with this minimax cell, right? And the only difference is uh, this logs and that our discriminator has to be a, has to be a k Lipschitz function. Okay. In other words, we are no longer, we are no longer computing binary cost entropy loss, right? In that we, our discriminator is no longer tasked to output a probability, but can be any real number. So, like the final, we can just remove the CMOI activation from the final layer of our discriminator. So, and for this reason, the discriminator in our WGAN is often referred to as the critic, right? Because what they're trying to do is not to output a probability, but rather just a score, right, of how real the images are. Right? So, you output 
a high score if it thinks the images are real, and a negative one if it thinks it's fake. Right. So in other words, the critic is trying to maximize the difference between uh, the predictions for the real images and generated images with the real images scoring higher. Yeah. So. Yeah, and so now you can train the critic multiple times, right? For each update of the generator. Yeah, I guess in practice, uh, you don't train the critic to convergence because that will take too long, right? But if you update your generator only with only after you train it to convergence. So what what actually happens is you just train the critic like k times and then you update your generator. So another thing is that the critic must be k Lipschitz continuous, right? which I don't talk about, so I'll talk about it right now. Now then we've introduced the minimap setup. Sorry, uh, yeah. the difference here is in, remember in the original camp, we said you only should update the critic once. That was one of the constraints, right? because if you try to do it too many times, then you will not be able to uh, do a good job with generating the critic. Right. So here it's a little bit the reverse. That's so right now it's just you train a critic k times for every but train a critic k times train because the, in that paper k and they yeah. said k equal to one. So it's kind of a little slight of hand. So here it's actually more than one. That's yes. So I guess I think it's because like technically you want to train your critic to convergence, right? So that you get better approximation of the elbow resistance. So that's the difference actually. Yes. Yeah. But in practice, you don't do so because I think it takes too long. Ah, sorry. Yeah, I have a question. So, is uh, WGI is like robust against the remote flops, flops, or do we still have a list of the model flops? Uh, model sorry. flops. Is uh, WGI is uh, robust against the model flops? Yeah, apparently, yes. Uh, do you have any intuitive like explanation because the, there's no like penalty to like to, um, to prohibit from uh, prohibit from the model collapsing because basically model collapse is happening because the there is no like motivation to generate a diverse image, right? So, so your question is why does the lossless thing can manage to create diverse images if it has no particular explicit loss to incentivize it to do that, right? Yeah, does anyone have an answer for that? <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, if you think about mode collapse, right, so basically if you look at the distributional landscape, say if you have a lot of like peaks, they're sort of like everywhere, right? But improvement systems will allow you to, to still achieve that peakiness, right? Because you don't have this problem that there's no uh, probability sitting in valleys that doesn't overlap at that point. So I think it doesn't explicitly optimize uh, to create diverse samples, but if you're trying to recreate the actual distribution, you're going to do it anyway. All right. So in the fail divergence, we have the two situations. Right? One way you get a distribution where right, it's we more about, average, uh, right? scale and reverse. Reverse scale, scale right? has this problem of just focusing on one moment. So maybe this behaves a bit more like regular fail divergence, which touches all the moments and it puts some probability on one moment. Okay, yeah, and the other whether yeah, in terms of it, because there's no explicit motivation. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, maybe Unity is like better in terms of like uh, creating a yeah. thing. Yeah. yeah, but that's a good question whether uh, EMD is uh, able to handle a lot of this uh, diverse testing. Because uh, I guess the thing is that if you have a lot of different classes and you want your can to create, you might have very high probability peaks in some area of your manifold, but you know, almost close to zero everywhere else, right? And so then you need to be able to push mass through those probes from uh, you know where it's almost no probability to stuff everything in here. Yeah, okay, thanks. So 
just to introduce the scale of chips continuity. So, so the, the definition is that for any two points, you have this inequality, right? So maybe I'll just read off the definition from Wikipedia because I think it's a bit quite intuitive in that. So um, if a function is Lipschitz continuous, um, it is limited in how fast it can change. So there exists some real number that such that for any pair of points on the graph of this function, the absolute value of the slope of the line connecting them is not greater than this number, right? Because you can um, because this expression can also be written like this, right? And uh, I guess it kind of means that like the factor in which the output of the function changes when the input changes should be bounded by something. Right? And geometry speaking, it looks kind of like this. So there's supposed to be a gift line that this cone will keep moving around the line. So geometrically speaking, if, if our function, if this function f is is Lipschitz continuous, uh, then we can draw a cone centered around every point such that the graph lies outside this cone. So you can shift this cone go around the points of this graph, but it's still one. The graph still lies outside the cone. Yeah, so I, I guess in the context of WGAN, like why do we need, why do we have this K Lipschitz continuous? Continuity, right? Is that like since we allow now we allow the critic to output any real number, right? So like maybe that maybe therefore like the the distance can be very large, and typically we want to avoid large numbers, right? In neural networks. So like maybe taking an example that uh, if our critic takes in two images, right? We want to require a limit on which the rate of the predictions between I want to limit the rate at which the predictions of the critic can change between two images. So yeah, I guess the role of this constraint is to like block the critic from arbitrarily enhancing small differences between two images. So we do this. So the authors do this just by keeping weights. So it's more right, to enforce to allow our critic to have to be a Lipschitz continuous function. Results from the paper. So this diagram just shows. So they set up an experiment, right, to showcase the difference between GAN and WGAN. So let's say we have this Gaussian for real distribution and this Gaussian for quick distribution, and we train a GAN discriminator and a WGAN critic to optimality, and then we just plot the values over the space. So the red line is those output by our GAN discriminator. Uh, as you can see, like I guess both both discriminators can like tell which distribution which distribution is real big, right? But the only difference is that our GAN discriminator does it in a way that makes the gradient vanish. Right? But in contrast, our WGAN gives a nice gradient over everything. Right. 
and it's also shown that our thermal resistance correlates with image quality. And it's also robust to architectural changes. So uh, like I think this over here is when you remove dash norm and it just breaks apart. Yeah, so move on to an extension of RWGAN. So, yeah. So the main problem that the the, big, the introduction of WGAN GP is trying to solve is that crossword equipping actually brings about some problems, right? As the original authors mentioned themselves. And that, right? Uh, this so our weight clipping parameter C right is very like the result of our model is very sensitive to tuning this uh, parameter our weight clipping parameter C. So why is this so? Is because uh, so this graph over here shows that you know when we turn batch top off, uh, the discriminator will move from so when C is low, it will move from. Uh, diminishing gradients to exploding gradients, right? So our gradients increase as uh, we back propagate them towards the earlier layers. And then if our C is uh, too large, our gradients will, in contrast, will explode. Okay. So I guess why is this so is because, like, for example, for vanishing gradients, like if you have a very deep network and if you clip the values to a very small value, right, clip all the weights to a small value. So then the error signal propagates back to the network will exponentially decrease, right? So that's why we have vanishing gradients. And for exploding gradients, so it's also been demonstrated that if we do weight clipping, our, our weights will be concentrated, concentrated on, the, on, the, on, our, on the upper bounds and lower bounds of our clipping interval. And this is a problem because like if if our C is like above the ideal weight initialization rights, and if we try to do back prop, the gradients will explode. And if the and if our C is below our ideal weight initialization, then our then we get vanishing gradients, right? Doing back propagation. So yeah, so for W again, uh, like. We have to balance like between this vanishing case and exploding case, which is very difficult. So that's why the authors, right? So yeah. So our problem with weight clipping is that you reduce the capacity of the model. So these are some images from the WGN GP paper. In that, uh, it shows that weight clipping, like decreases reduces the capacity of the model, right? And then so the first row is for WGN, and the second row is for WGN GP. And as you can see, uh, like, like the WGAN always feels to model this complex boundary, right? And also to surround, surround the modes of the data set. Yeah. While the WGAN GP can do so. Easily. This yeah. one answers this. So it's, it's a bit like that real divergence. The top one is just broadly distributed across all the modes. It's just the square which touches all the dots. But at the second one, it's a lot more. So it's the, the first one is just an average that just spread across all the modes. Right. The yeah, basic you can see that it's actually mode. putting the peaks where where the Gaussian centers are, right? It's not averaging it all. Yeah, I think you do refer to this earlier when we when we lectured on the, the scale divergence of universal data, right? The same problem. Yeah, so to solve this, like I guess the natural thing is just like you just include a penalty right into your loss function. So what is this thing over here? Right, so the paper shows that uh, the principal function f is one of the if and only if it has greatest with norm and most one. So, 
what we do is just we just include this energy term up in there. We just penalize when the value of the norm of the gradient of the critic is away from one. So now it's a soft constraint, right? It's not a hard constraint if you fit everything you want. It's just that if it exceeds one, you, you give it a penalty, you slap it on the wrist and say, don't do that. Go back down. Yeah, I guess one tricky, one tricky part of this is that uh, like it's intractable to calculate the gradient, right? Of the calculate the gradient everywhere during the training process. So instead, what the author suggests is that we sample from this uh, x hat, where x hat is some linear interpolation between real and fake samples. So like technically it looks like this in that like we like just take some pairs of images and we sample from an interpolation between them. Right, so a pair of image, we just sample this, this, and this, and this will be our x hat. I guess the paper provides a more mathematical justification of why they do this, but I guess intuitively, like it is to ensure a more balanced mix, like yeah. Like to ensure a balanced mix of our uh, input space, that we just use the set of interpolated images that lie randomly among lines connecting the batch of real images to the batch of fake images. Right. So, in other words, uh, when completing gradient, there's like another four pass up, right? We have this. We have to form an alpha pass to calculate this uh, term over here. All right, so just to summarize the differences between GP, that again, GP, and whatever that again. So we no longer fit the weights of the critic because we include this gradient penalty term. And also, we don't use batch norm layers in the critic. Right. This is because batch norm will create correlation between the images in the same batch, which makes our GP loss less effective. Yeah, but it's more competition intensive, right? Because we have to do one more forecast to network. Yeah, so that's it for the beginning GP. So uh, a few so good things. Just go back to that slide. Uh, any rational why you don't want to patch on the Mm, I guess it's something like because you only go critic to map from a single input, single input to a single output, right? But batch norm kind of changes that to mapping from entire batch of inputs to entire batch of outputs. And for calculating our gradient penalty term. So in that context, like our, because we want to, So I wrote down that uh, it's because it creates correlation between images in the same batch. I'm not really sure why. Does anyone have an idea for this? If not, I think we just move on for now. Yeah, yeah I guess we can go ahead. We'll try to look it up on this private side. Yeah, so as compared to WGAN, there's enhanced training stability. 
So these are the inception scores. So as you can see, it performs pretty well. Right over here and over here. Right. I guess you notice uh, this thing actually performs much better. So this is red line over here. Uh, but I guess one advantage of double GP is like it's more more stable, right? You can see by the inception how the inception score converges. So yeah, so the major advantage of double GP is its convergency. So it's more easier to trick, apparently. And that's why we can use more complex models like ResNet. So by using ResNet, it actually scores the highest inception score. Right, that's reported. So anything like discuss about that again? Any other questions about the GP version? Yeah, so I'll just so last thing I'll just cover a bit about progressive GANs. So I also didn't really research too much into progets. So I'll just like mention a few of the key innovations. So there's four points. So the main controversy of this program is that it can generate really high resolution images. Right. So in the paper, it's demonstrated uh, 1024 by 1024, but I think like technically you can generate even higher resolution images given more computational time, right? Using their training regime. So the cool thing they did is they use they train using this thing called progressive growing. In that. So, yeah, so instead of trading all the layers, so instead of like initializing this huge network all at once, like you, you just start off with a small network and just gradually train and then grow the network layer by layer. Okay. So, yeah, so they actually started with like four by four pixels. Or, so they strung their training images to four by four. And also, so our discriminator will also be, will just be a mirror version of, so it's also a 4 by 4 and, and because you start with a very small network, right? So this network will actually train very quickly. And when the layers are completed, when these first layers are, have computer training, you just add another layer. So you double output each time. So once you've trained your 4 by 4 then you add another 8 by 8 layer. And I guess the reason why this works is because uh, like by, by increasing the resolution gradually, right, you are continuously asking your network to learn a much like simpler piece of the overall problem, right? And I guess the way it stabilizes training. So uh, the goal you say is, is that we start off with easy to traverse loss landscape, and then we gradually increase complexity by increase the number of layers as we get closer to like the part of the lost landscape that we're trying to zoom into. Yeah, and it also turns out that uh, increasing the network size gradually is more computationally efficient, right? Because fewer layers are faster to train. And since like all but the final set of training iterations are done with a subset of all the eventual layers, right? There's a lot of efficiency gains from this, as opposed to training like this huge network from the start. Yeah, and so maybe a bit more about the technical details of how this progressive growing is done. So like as we as we like introduce a new layer, we don't actually like freeze the lower layers. Like what we do is what authors do is that we they smoothly they try to smoothly fade in this new layer, right? So so what happens is this, right? So as you finish training your first layer, right, you will uh, introduce these two pathways. Okay. So the, the first pathway is just just some upscaling layer, right? Because we want to, yeah. So it's just a typical like upscaling layer that we have that we want to learn. So and our upscaling layer in this case is just uh, a bilinear, I think. So a nearest neighbor assembly followed by a composition layer. 
So yeah, but to sort of smoothing out, to sort of smoothly fade in this new layer, what they did is they will keep they will keep the the whole output up, right? So so you will uh, they will upsize the whole output by two, and then. Uh, yeah, so they choose a new layer, but also retain some of this fuel sample. And they combine these two layers by this parameter alpha. So, so at, the, at the start, alpha will be uh, low value, right? So, that's, so you retain most of the whole output. But then as you keep training, you will just keep increasing alpha all the way to one. So, so when you finish trading and when alpha is one, you're essentially throwing away the that one output. Up. So all you have is your new upsampling layer. Yeah. Okay. Right. Because like as can I mentioned, if you suddenly introduce a new layer into a network, you are like changing your loss landscape very it's, it's like it's a massive shock for the training. So you smoothly fade in the news layer instead by keeping some of the views up. Like this. So you, when you said two hours, you introduced the 16 by oh sorry, 32 by 32. Yeah, so the upsetting layer is just, uh, I think, I, think I, I guess traditionally you use a transpose layer, but for this architecture, they just use upsetting followed by uh, convolution layers. Essentially, it's just a learn outstanding layer. Yeah, so this is smoothly progress. So, what another thing they introduced is this mini batch standard deviation. So, I think it's a way to uh, combat mode collapse. So, uh, what it did is Right. So they just compute, compute a single scalar value of the standard deviation of some so this feature map. So, so they actually compute this standard deviation near the end of the discriminator. And then they will take like this feature map that's output some layer at the end of the discriminator and compute the standard deviation. So I guess, so this, yeah, so they will compute this standard division value and just append it as an extra channel, uh, as an extra feature map to the next layer. So I guess it provides a signal for the discriminator to tell whether the sample is getting a very low. Right. Uh, yeah. yeah. So with this signal, I guess it will, Encourage the generator to produce like more variety, right? Such that so there's a standard division that's computed across like a batch, a generator batch will resemble more or resemble those from a training data batch. Okay. I think we saw this before in the paper group one, right? Mini batch overseas. I guess the last thing is this is this another type of normalization. Uh, if not wrong, if not wrong, it's, it's, I think just the same. So typically you use match, match one, right? But however, for progens, uh, there's not enough memory because uh, in order for a batch one to work, you need like reasonably large mini batches, right? For like the individual samples to average on. So is too memory intensive. So what we do is just pixel-wise normalization. So we will just and so for for each pixel, for each pixel you have uh, this feature vector, right? So we just normalize it to do it normal. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, so there's no like extra parameters. It's just this normalization procedure. It's after each composition layer. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's it for programs. three uh, novel listening to proposed uh, game models. And the first one is the uh, self-attention game. The self-attention game uh, is an improvement of um, SM game, and it has improved the inception score from uh, inception score from 36 to 52, and the previous uh, FIP from 27 to 18. Very good progress. Okay. Use two fingers to scroll. Uh, and this is a, a, a first question is why do we need self attention? And you, as you can see, uh, if you don't use the self attention, you generate pictures. Of dogs like, like, uh, like this. Look at these dogs. Uh, it can obvious that these dogs, you can, uh, these previous cat models can easily capture the the bodies of the dogs, but it's very hard to. It's, it's always ignores the legs of the dogs. Uh, in other words, uh, it can capture the local, concrete local features of dogs, but it may lose the uh, uh, long range dependencies of dogs, which is more abstract. So the self, uh, the self can, uh, the SM can solve the problem with this. And this is overall structure of SM can. Uh, this, uh, this means matrix multiplication and uh, the three functions f of x, g of x, h of x, h of x is actually three matrix. So this is w of x equals this and uh, g of x equals w g times x and uh, h of x equals w h times x. And this w h, w g, w f are three. Uh, weighted parameters and these three matrix are to be trained by this model. And finally, they've got an attention map, shows the attention of the whole image. And this is a, a, a formula for the previous models. And I will not talk about more. And then I'm going to talk about some certain bits of the, of the Sega. First of all, it applies spectrum normalization to both the generator and the discriminator. Uh, most of the previous works only attach this um, spectrum normalization on the discriminator because they think that, that only the discriminator needs to be regularized. But uh, this, in this paper, uh, the author argues that it can prevent the escalation of parameter and avoid on your gradients if uh, the spectrum normalization is applied to the generator. Yes, so, and actually in practice, it works pretty well. And the second point is, uh, in, in the Sagan, it uses self-attention in both the generator and discriminator. And the self-attention is just the model we have mentioned before. And the third one is hinge loss. Hinge loss is a, is a, is a, is a new loss function, which has been, I think we have mentioned it in the SN gap. It looks like, Uh, yes, uh, this function. This is a uh, hinge loss. And 
and this loss function is widely used in the in the modern GAN models, and it works pretty well in practice. And then the finally, uh, it can uh, SN GAN can be adopted to both. Uh, unconditional and uh, conditional examples. It is the first, uh, uh, it is the first again model that can generate the full unconditional image and examples. Uh, conditional means uh, given the, the uh, saying I want you to generate dogs and then you generate a serious, a serious picture dogs and I want you to generate fish and you generate fish. But unconditional means I give you a data set and you train it then you generate pictures from this data set, whatever you want. And this is the first again that can produce good unconditional full image net examples. Uh, then let's look at some uh, pictures generated from SNGAN. The first uh, the first picture, the first column is, is a real picture and there are three representative thought, uh, three representative points. Uh, let's look at the first picture. Yeah, there are three representative points acting colored in red, green, and blue. And the following three pictures are actually the, the uh, most attention area. The, the red, the, uh, the light area is the most attention area for each representative point. Look at the blue point. The blue point falls on the bird's tail. And then the, after the SNGAN train, the blue point, the, uh, the, the most attention area of the blue point uh, actually uh, perfectly match the, su the size of the bird's tail. And let's look at the second picture, the dog. The blue point falls on the dog's, dog's leg, front leg. And then after training, the most attention area actually uh, describes the size, the, the shape of the dog's front leg, and it works pretty well. Uh, it means that the self-attention model can not only capture the features by the spatial adjacency, but it also captures capture the features according to their colors and their texture. So it can work better than it can capture more abstract features, and it can work more better than the previous convolutional games. And these are all good pictures uh, generated from SNGAN. Uh, this is a experimental result of SNGAN, and you can see that it can it outperforms the uh, previous cell uh, SNGAN with this projection, both in inception score and FID. Uh, this is all for SNGAN, and let's turn to the next model. So, any questions about the self attention again first? Anyone care to summarize it for us so that we can get a high level summary? So, it's addressing the same type of problem as what we were talking about in Lisa's uh, app with the presentation. I just want to make sure that you guys are still, still sort of here. <laughs> and you guys can. I'm saying the self attention is most likely to be using NLP right now. We're just trying to yes. capture a long, long distance relationship. Yes. Uh, Quite as the image, what else trying to do is they're trying to capture the spatial spatial relationship with the dogs, not just focusing on the local characteristic of the dog, but looking at it as a broad thing. What's the relationship to this part of that? Uh, so the result shows it not only it does that, it also does something else that captures one particular feature of the dog. So yeah. Solves it. It's kind of like different problems with the previous two, two versions of the tool. We're just more focusing on the training side, the business side. It's more things related to that. Yeah, I think they're completely different approaches, right? Like, at the very least, they're in the same ballpark. One is talking about the first half of our lecture today is talking about the problem of discriminator saturation, right? If you have a discriminator that's doing too well, you don't have a gradient. Generator. And then this one 
scores that uh, we were just talking about with the, the brief data points, right, and, and seeing where the attention lies, it's still sort of confused. They're, they're not very strong, uh, not, not as well correlated with, with other pieces of information you might get from a vision system like um, uh, segmentation, right, segmentation equals segment in the entire area uh, with respect to uh, texture or something. Any other inputs? Okay, let's go on. Okay, now I'm going to talk about another GAN model, BGAN. And this has a very good picture generated from BGAN. And first of all, I want to talk about an improvement of the regularization of the generation. This is a previous regularization functions for uh, generation. And we began to use the second one. Uh, actually, uh, suggest uh, in the first formula, if um, if the w if w if w transpose times w looks like this, the diagonal elements look like this. Um, the first formula actually uh, minus one for each diagonal elements, like it will get this. But in the in the version of big N, it will get a, a w to w, 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 w. It get a, it actually set every diagonal element to the zero. Uh, this is the element wise man, uh, manipulation. Uh, actually, it changed a way to regularization, and it in practice it works much better than the previous works. And if you use the first you use the first formula for regularization for the generator, then you get pictures like this. You get pictures like this. Uh, I think it's, it's a good idea if you want to generate the ghost or monster. Yeah. And in practice, they found the second, the second formula. They, they, in the paper, they say that this is the best way they found to, um, to regularize the generation. And then this is uh, the last picture. Picture is the uh, overall structure of the gap. and it actually the B is a latent vector. And first, it split the latent vector into different chunks, and then they com they concatenate each chunk with a class embedding, and then feed the feed the result into each level of the rest block. And then they found uh, in this model, because you, you need to uh, split the vector, latent vector z into different chunks, so it uh, it can cannot be very deeper. So if because they want to their models to grow deeper, they design another model by making a few modifications, and then comes a big and deep. In big and deep, they simply concatenate the whole latent vector z to the class embedding and then feed the result into each level of the block. And this is the inner structure of the rest block, very complicated. And this is a detailed size of each level, and the left column is for generator, and the right column is for discriminator. Then I'm going to talk about, uh, I'm going to skip these two slides and we'll see some other uh, tricks like 
and we'll, then we'll go back later. Uh, this table shows how they how they turn the hyperparameters. Uh, they use second as their baseline, and then they try to double the batch, double the batch, double the batch size, and then they try to double the parent, the number of parents. And they found they got a very pretty good result. They, they nearly doubled the inception score. Uh, that's very cool, I don't know why. And they just made a lot of improvement by just doing the parameters, and then they introduced some, uh, some novel, uh, some actually some original Methods to improve their improve their performance, like the of like the of the normal. Uh, this means of the normal uh, regularization, which we have mentioned before. Is that formula the most of dogs? Yeah, and finally, the same as the other gradient. Sorry, the other gradient. The W then sushi and this. Uh, actually, it, uh, the Plus shell. The and, actually, these are the, some components which has been so uh, which have been proposed in some other papers, and they just uh, bring them there and uh, try to combine them together and see any improvements. And if there is, they will add it in this table. And finally, they got a very good result by the, just just uh, adjusting parameters and choose the methods. Yes. And then this is a very important trick proposed in BCAM. It is called truncation trick. What does it mean? Uh, truncation trick means generate the latent vector Z from a truncated normalization distribution. Uh, Say this is a normalization distribution. This is a normalization distribution. And then saying there is a threshold saying minus one to one. Then you try to generate latent vector Z from this normal distribution. If the latent vector Z falls out of the threshold, it will be regenerated until it falls inside the uh, threshold. So it ensures that every latent vector Z is inside the threshold. Then there's a very interesting thing that you can adjust the threshold. Saying if you have a very narrow threshold, then the latent vector Z and the final generated uh, pictures will be will be of high fidelity but less variety. Like the uh, figures in uh, figure A, the right part of the figure A. Look at the four pictures. The four pictures actually look the same, and it was generated by the same model four times or four, four times. And you can say that uh, this model has very low variety, but very high fidelity because every picture looks really like real dogs. Uh, in, in the country, if you use a very wild uh, threshold, then you'll get pictures like the left side. It is of high variety, but, uh, but less fidelity. Look, uh, these four pictures are pretty, pretty different, right? But the fourth, third picture and the fourth picture actually do not look like real dogs. So it is a uh, uh, so the truncation trick actually gives enables people to um, to trade off between the fidelity and the and the like variety. Actually, in the in practice, you want the pictures in the middle, right? Uh, it is a trade off between fidelity and variety. So it's very useful in the, the practice. And these are all pictures generated by Big Gen. It's all very good for pictures, uh, except this one. Uh, this is a block board. And uh, it is actually generated from a partial trained model. And the authors want to use this picture to, uh, to uh, show a phenomenon called uh, class leakage, which means uh, this picture uh, this picture contains the uh, features from different classes like balls, dogs, and balls. Uh, so that's all for the big game model. So any comments? Did they talk much more about class leakage? Uh, 
uh, class leakage. Actually, um, in the previous in the previous works, most of people think that uh, a train uh, a pre a partial trained model um, only has one shortage is that it cannot uh, describe the class very clearly. But the uh, but the this uh, by the authors uh, produced uh, but the authors state that class leakage is also a problem that's faced by the partial trained models because um, partial trained models were not only Contains uh, uh, the the not um, uh, it, is, it is possible that for partial constraint model be influenced by the information of other classes and would be influenced by other features. So uh, this is a novel phenomenon uh, proposed by this paper. I don't know about you guys. I kind of like the tennis ball. <laughs> looks like a Pokemon. <laughs> <laughs> we got this image because last week we combined like, all the distribution of different apps into a one single one, right? Yes. I, I don't know. I mean, you could exploit this property, right? Like, yes. do, you, do you have this, you know, idea of uh, Greek mythological animals like the centaur or yeah. the spear of the phoenix or something like that? Uh, if you can transfer certain qualities from one from one class to another class, you have something like a stylistic transfer, right? But you're, you're transferring, you know, the eyes of something to texture of something else, to body parts of something else. It looks like one of those morphed images, but it's probably morphed in some somewhere in the boundary. Yeah. 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 It's very interesting. Like if you look at the NVIDIA video that I posted on the Slack, you can actually watch where but again, it's propagating its image outward from the center to the outside. It's quite interesting. Like uh, the, the pixels and successive iterations are getting that information spreading out from the, the center, which has made its decision to change. So, yeah, it could be the working part. I don't know. Uh, actually, in this paper, this picture is generated by accident. It is not. So we don't we can't control uh, which which class we want to generate from, and we, we can't uh, get features from each class and then bind them together. So it's just an accident we generated features. Right, all good accidents lead to innovation. <laughs> so any other questions? Uh, then I will go to the uh, last two slides, and I will briefly introduce the last, last model called StyleGAN. Actually, StyleGAN differs from the previous GAN because uh, in, a pre in most of the previous GAN, uh, there will be the latent vector Z as an input to the convolutional layers, but in the StyleGAN, it does a different thing. It first maps the latent vector Z to a latent uh, to a terminant latent latent space called W, and then in this latent space it will map the vector W to each convolutional layer. It will feed it to each convolutional layer instead of just as an input of the data. And uh, meanwhile, it adds Gaussian noise, just like Gaussian noise. It will add Gaussian noise to each layer before the uh, the latent vector, and finally, after the training, it will get a very good result. It is mostly done on human face, so uh, this column is a real picture. Real pictures. This column is a real picture, and actually, there is a, another column is also a real picture here. And they generate the pictures like this. You can see that the each column and each row has the same and has some same, same features in your faces. Like uh, this, uh, this, it, this generate pictures uh, have the same color like this guy, and this column has the same same uh, shape of the face. Uh, it is it is from the it is from this row, and there is another real picture. So this is a very lifelike pictures and performs really well in uh, human face. And actually, this is all. Uh, this is all for StyleGAN. Any questions on that? All good. Okay. 
Thanks, Jack, for our speaker. Reminder, uh, we, we have our uh, interim deadline of having our uh, project abstracts online, so please uh, get them in if, if you haven't uh, already. I will try to find some time to uh, give you at least one or two comments, but if you look around at other people's projects, it would be good, uh, good if you, uh, you yourselves can have some peer interaction. You know, when I think about GANs, I also want to think about like a uh, teacher or facilitator and student GANs. In other words, you know, it shouldn't be the lecture always just talking, right? Yeah. Uh, we, we all as students want to, to interact, and, and um, I hope all of you will make more of an effort uh, to, to interact with uh, our presenters. I know some of you are busy scrubbing, but most of us are not, so I don't know where, where everyone else is at this time. Okay, so in, in any case, uh, let us uh, thank all of our students who have been with us for the first half of the semester. Uh, I think we will have uh, one more chance to see them next week. And uh, for those of you uh, interested in hanging out, uh, we'll be leaving from the downstairs bus stop near the business school to go to the old bar and the uh, faculty club in uh, about five minutes. So have a bathroom break and uh, we'll see you in a while. Thanks a lot. Bye, right, Johnny. So, who's speaking next week? Anyone presenting next week?